Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmer Podcast listeners, Michael here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer Podcast. Today, my guest is Nick Rittar, who is the co-director of Milkwood, an educational enterprise dedicated to teaching skills to regenerate the earth. Since 2007, Rittar, with his partner, Kirsten Bradley, have given over 15,000 students the opportunity to learn from the world's best sustainable farmers, market gardeners, and permaculturalists. Their first book, Milkwood, Real Skills for Down-to-Earth Living, was released in September 2018. In 2019, Milkwood launched their first online course, Permaculture Living, a 12-week intensive course with the co-originator of permaculture, David Holgrim, and they have recently launched their second online course on home mushroom cultivation. Welcome to the podcast, Nick. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you. Yeah, and you are in Australia, so you're, as you said, on the other side, you're just getting up, we're you know, getting ready to end the day here. Yeah, we're uh, almost at the opposite side of the world. We're about as far south as you can go in the English speaking world. We're at the very southern tip of Tasmania, which is, for those who don't know, is an island off the south of Australia. Okay, wow. So you are down there. So <laughs> what is the weather then this time of year like for you? So it's, it's coming towards the sort of second half of summer. Um, down here, because we're so far down in the Southern Ocean, uh, our, our summers are pretty cool. So um, mm -hmm. we, you know, rarely get over sort of 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the middle of the day. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we can have quite cool evenings in the summer. Um, but conversely, it's also very mild. We, we basically never get a frost. Uh, it, uh -huh. it never really freezes down here as well, which is because we're right down at sea level as well. So yes. it's very mild climate. That must be nice. A bit like so, the Pacific Northwest, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, talk to us. You guys have been operating for some time now. How many years have you been in the whole, uh, like I said, permaculture space? So we we moved from uh, Melbourne, which is a pretty big city uh -huh. uh, of about uh, four and a half million people, to a very remote farm uh, in 2007, and okay. we uh, we moved there to to live a, a more sort of sustainable lifestyle, one with less travel and growing our own food and uh, trying our hand at regenerative farming. Um, so we've been doing this for ooh, what's that, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what what would you feel like you're the biggest lessons you've learned along the way in, um, I guess, say first educating people because you're you do a lot of education. Would you say that for learning for education is? Yeah. So I I mean over the years we've had so many students who uh, who come to to farming with such a passion. You know they get really excited by the change that they can make in the world. You know uh -huh. a, a positive food system and a, um, a a more regenerative way of managing landscapes and. Um, you know, so often uh, we see people throw themselves into into their project, and that's definitely what we did when we started. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the biggest lesson that um, that I've learned from both our own experience and from all our students' experiences is that you really need to have a clear vision of of the way that you want to live your everyday life. Um, what does what does success actually look like? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people focus on the on the on the project and they forget about what their personal life is going to look like and yeah. those two i think have to align to to have success and to have um you know a sustainable future with your with your family and your and your business yeah so the the holistic aspect not only is your land it's your time it's who you are it's how you interact your relationships with those around you yeah, what do you want to do when you get up in the morning and and what do you want to spend your day doing and how much time do you want to take off each year or spend to spend with your family and each day and how much do you want to be involved in your kids' yeah. education and all those kinds of things that I think a lot of us miss when we first start. Yeah, okay, so would you say that um, any type of farming allows that lifestyle or do you feel like you have to be really intentional about picking the the different farming, I guess, niches out there? 
Uh, I think it's, I think that, you know, there are, there's potential in, in every um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, type of agriculture um, in terms of um, whether you be doing something with perennial plants or whether mm -hmm. it's a, a cropping business or whether it's a, a grazing a enterprise or something, you know, really uh, intensive horticulture. All of them are, have amazing potential. Um, the, the big challenge is always, you know, whether there is a, a, a financial model that works for that business. And, um, I, you know, I think it's it's maybe there's different challenges in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, down here, one of the really, really big challenges is, and I'm sure it is where you are and where most of your listeners are too, is the cost of land. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, access to land is really expensive. So, uh, you know, working out a business model that manages to, to pay that mortgage or, or um, you know, pay that rent and, and still have enough left over for your, for your, um, for your lifestyle is, is a huge challenge, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the thing with land, I mean, land here ranges from like 7,000 an acre to we've seen 1215. Um, and then obviously what depends on where you are in the country, it can go much higher. Like the Salinas Valley is $100,000 an acre um, yeah. for prime agricultural land. What's the range down there? And I'm sure is that in hectares down there? Um, we're, we're kind of a little bit like the English. We use a bit of both. Um, okay. So, uh, I, I, I talk... Um, uh, in acres usually uh, by accident. Um, and of course, the exchange rate's a bit different too. So yeah. for every one of your dollars buys about one and a half of our dollars. So mm -hmm, we've got to increase mm -hmm. it by about 50%. Um, but yeah, similar sorts of range of, of prices you can get. It, it all depends on the quality. Australia is a very large country. It's a similar yeah. sort of size to the United States um, with only one tenth of the population. So there's very yeah. large areas of land that where, where land is very, very cheap. Um, conversely, we have one of the most urban populations on the planet. And that means that our big cities, uh, the, the, the high quality farmland around those big cities is insanely expensive uh -huh. because of that, um, that classic to, um, yeah. uh, competition between lifestylers and, you know, people who, who are buying land just to live on it and those uh -huh. who are actually uh -huh. actively, actively trying to farm it. Um, yeah. You know, so um, we've we've had we've brought Joel Salt into Australia a few times, and one of the um, lessons we learnt from him was, you know, that um, you don't necessarily have to own land to um, to farm it. And uh, a lot of people have taken inspiration of that over the years and have um, worked out novel, yeah. interesting ways to access other people's land who who really appreciate them farming it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell us a little bit about the book you've written, and then been, that's been quite successful. What are the principles that that drew you to to write that that book? Uh, it was a bit of an experiment, actually, and uh, it's gone very well. Uh, mm -hmm. It's rather than um, I suppose our, our space is is now mostly uh, working with with people who want to grow their own food mm -hmm. uh, more than necessarily you know, commercial farmers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, when we started out, we spent the first 10 years or so of Milkwood really focusing on regenerative agriculture. We were on a 1,500-acre yeah. 1, farm, um, grazing sheep and, and uh, growing olives. And we, over time, uh, with our, you know, seeing how challenging uh, the farming business was, especially in the location we were, um, we, we saw that there were, we were getting approached by a lot of people who wanted to grow their own food, basically. Yes. And who were um, having a lot of challenges with agriculture. So the book is focused on, on, um, on self-sufficiency and, um, and permaculture and, and how to produce a really happy and healthy home for ourselves. Um, and it's really, the experiment was that rather than try to cover all aspects of that, you know, which is a huge mm -hmm. and diverse um, range of topics. We uh, just concentrated on on five different topics. Um, so rather than, you know, split it up too much, the, the book, although it's 300 odd pages, it only has five things that it's about. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, and, it, and we try to do those five things really, really well. Um, and that's that's something I think it's a lesson for, for a lot of farming enterprises is don't diversify too much. Uh, yeah. because that, that can really draw you in too many directions. So this book's about the tomato, uh, mushroom cultivation, natural beekeeping, um, seaweed, and yep. wild food. Uh, so those five topics are, are what makes up the book. And, and we've got uh, another couple of books actually in the pipeline as well to yeah. um, continue on with those kinds of 
kinds of themes. Yeah. But by going deep, that allowed you to really kind of, I mean, just share everything there was to know about those. Yeah. And it, it was a balance really. There's, if, if you take, for instance, mushroom cultivation, yes. there's, um, there's experts in that field who, yeah. who are 100%, you know, people like uh, Paul Stamets, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you had, uh, is it William Padilla Brown yep. on, I think yep. a little while back. Um, yep. Now, uh, those guys are completely absorbed with mushroom cultivation. Yes. That's their thing. And if, if I have a detailed technical question about something very, very complicated about, about growing mushrooms, I'm going to go to them every yes. time because that's their life. I'm someone who's passionate about growing mushrooms. You know, we mm -hmm. grow a lot of mushrooms as, as home scale growers. Um, but our systems that we develop are designed for home scale growers. They're mm -hmm. not about commercial. They're not about, you know, being the mycologist who knows everything about mushrooms. They're stuff that's just practical and easy to follow and will get you success um, yeah. at that home level. Well, I, I think it's important to note that commercial mushroom production, production is not the same as the home style. No. And the and cost associated with that and all of that is so different. So being able to put a system together that allows me in my backyard or my, my kitchen to do it or under my bathroom sink is so important. Yeah. And the quality is very different too. I mean, mm -hmm. um, a commercial mushroom grower, uh, for example, or a commercial tomato farmer, um, their goal is to produce the best possible produce that they can for a price, for a cost mm -hmm. of inputs, for a cost of labor, um, for uh, 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 being able to get that product to market at, at its highest potential quality. Absolutely, yep. Right. But for a home grower, a lot of the times you throw out all that cost saving. You're not, you're not necessarily yeah. doing it. You're trying to produce the best thing you, you can, possibly can yes. for yourself and you, for your friends and for your family. And I mean, I don't know about you, but um, the, the homegrown food that your friends grow, uh, is, is they, the passionate amateur can often produce something which is, uh, far beyond what mm -hmm. a professional person can, because there's, there's not those same constraints. Absolutely. Yeah. I, that's, that's so true. And then you, and, then, and as a, as a commercial farmer, cause I, I actually say that cause we actually have do multiple acres of production here. I then look at that and be like, oh my gosh. Um, but it's just, it's just, uh, it's just what that is. And, you know, yeah. it's the care you can put into that one plant compared to when you have 500 to a thousand plants that you're dealing with and trying to get tons of production. And, and if you're a commercial farmer and you're attempting to, um, produce the absolute best, yeah. then you're probably doing it wrong, frankly. Um, yes. you know. Yeah, well, that, the, you're probably wasting a lot of effort. And... Well, the cost that you have to put into that, it's just so high. Um, and yes, I mean, you can, but it, it's like, if, well, and I think the thing is we also have to realize, and we can talk about this, is how does, especially here in the US, the, the, the average consumer value food and what are they willing to pay? Like we go to Japan and I'm blown away by what they pay for a melon, what they pay for a pear, what they pay for a strawberry compared to in the US where they would laugh you out of town if you put a $500 cost on a melon. Yeah, and that's always always going to be a challenge for anybody, especially in the regenerative agriculture space, um, trying to produce a high quality product for a large number of people rather than mm -hmm. um, you know this very bourgeois perspective of going for the absolute best and only and and going for the premium where the only people who can afford to pay for it are michelin hatted chefs or yeah. um you know the, the the incredibly wealthy that is an option that's always an option yeah. you know pe people can do that and especially um if you've got access to a to a um a market that's prepared to pay for those those products you know shiitake log grown shiitake is a classic example mm -hmm. um in japan you know there's a there's a huge premium paid for log growing shiitake down here in australia the the consumer is just not aware of the difference a shiitake mushroom is exotic on its own let yes. alone you know this perfect log grown shiitake with the crackling flower pattern on the, mm -hmm, on the surface mm -hmm. that's been grown in a in a in a forest um yeah. it, 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 it the consumers just will not reward that yeah. And then at the time of year too, because the time of year changes for a shiitake, it's amazing the difference between like a June grown here and a September grown. Yeah. So, 
But so I think in the States, there's, there's maybe a middle ground. I think there is probably an appreciation of that. Um, mm -hmm. And that means that there is a market there. But again, do you want to focus on um, selling this incredible premium product and the, the challenges of those picky consumers and, and the, the, the shipping and the, the complexity of meeting their demands? Or do you want to produce, you know, a, I don't know what your price is, $10 a pound, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, good quality bulk material, uh, uh, shiitake that, that people at your local uh, market yeah. are going to pay for? Well, it's, it makes, uh, I was in New York City and I did a, hot, a project there for a hot second. And we were in the, the uh, Shikomoko, it was just very valley. And um, he was in a, one of the city markets and saw $48 a pound arugula. And yeah. he was like, oh, I'm going to blow this out. I'm going to do thousands of pounds at $48 a pound. I'm going to make more money off this than my hedge fund. <laughs> he was paying me really well. So obviously, you know, I was trying to work on his business model, but it came down to, and I was like, I just don't think it's going to work is, is when I, I got the boot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, we, I mean, I, I've had uh, a classic uh, a classic sort of permaculture story. We we used to do a lot of permaculture design certificates, long, yeah. intensive, two week long mm -hmm. courses, um, and people would always come to me with these business ideas. And I remember the, the the really common one was water chestnuts. Water chestnuts. People pay so much money for water chestnuts. They're so easy to grow. You can grow them on wastewater. They don't need anything at all. And it's like, yeah, but your volumes aren't going to be very big because nobody eats water chestnuts. You know. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like the uh, edible flowers. Yep. Yeah, there's so many business models like that, and yeah. and there's that, that, that's a that's a challenge too. I mean, you also you, you don't want to necessarily grow you know just potatoes or I suppose where yeah. you're from just just corn. You know, it's uh, yeah. all maize. It's uh, um, those bulk commodity crops are, are hard to make a quid out of as well. So let's throw this at there too. Is is you know depends on where you feel the world is going. We've seen a lot of upheavals. Stuff's going a little bit crazy. And then it's also like, do you build a business model, which is going to be completely disrupted? And I saw multiple businesses go out of business because of the whole kind of, you know, world changing. And then, you know, it depends on where you feel the world's going. Do you focus on the hard staples, which, you know, are very easy to produce, or do you keep going for that higher level? And are you building resiliency into your business system that allows you to change quickly if something does happen really crazily? Yeah. And, and I mean, I suppose, I think this is common everywhere. Um, for me, the choices that me and my family have made yeah. have been around, um, you know, moving somewhere and living somewhere where there's a good, strong community with a range mm -hmm. of different um, industries. You know, the local farmers here that um, that do well, They're, we have you know, a very, a very um, a thriving tourist industry and there is a gourmet um, sector to that. So there are uh, quite a few of our friends and, um, and local farmers who are, who, are, who are catering to that high yeah. end market. But then, you know, there's, there's successful um, small farms that are, that are modest, that are, are just producing, you know, mixed vegetables or, uh, you know, mixed grazing enterprises or poultry enterprises and, and those sort of maybe not potatoes and 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 wheat and and corn, yeah. Um, but those but those um, uh, somewhat diverse small um, enterprises that are that are feeding everyday people with everyday food. I think uh, they're probably the most reliable and they're probably the most um, long term. If you can build a lifestyle around that, then mm -hmm. they're they're uh, you know uh, uh, can be fantastic. You know, great for your yeah. family, great for your kids. But a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah. And I think that thing is too, is looking at what the current demographic is going after because the demographic does change. And it's amazing to see this over the 17 years now I've been in, in agriculture is just, you know, back at the beginning, we were selling a lot more bushels and half bushels. And now it's, um, they don't even want to do you pick anymore, which blows mm. my mind. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, it was just really interesting to see that this year, especially. Um, talk to us about... Um, your, so you do like in, some in-person education too and online, or is it strictly now with how things are going more online? Well, we spent, uh, like I said, in 2007, we started, we moved back to the family farm and we yeah. started, we knew that we didn't know enough to manage that land um, in a sustainable fashion and a regenerative mm -hmm. fashion. So we had a backgrounds in um, technology and we had mm -hmm. backgrounds in event management. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thought, well, how about we, we bring some people to the farm to, 
to teach us how to do things. We didn't have any money, so we needed to yeah. work out a way to fund that. Uh, yeah. And we thought, well, we'll run an event. And uh, I think um, uh, we started off with some Australian sort of permaculture legends and we brought them onto the farm and then we, we diversified and started bringing people from, from uh, wider afield. And uh, we got to the stage where we were running about 70 face-to-face -face courses per year. Um, wow. And having well over a thousand students a year um, uh, coming to the yeah. farm, um, you know, small classes, 20, 30 people at a time uh, yeah. on everything from, you know, biofertilizer. We, we'd, we'd have um, uh, South American biofertilizer experts and we'd have, um, you know, uh, American uh, grazing management experts and European fermenters and all kinds of different people yeah. coming to, to Australia to teach these courses. and. It was very, very hard. Um, we spent, uh, we were, we were spending every weekend running events. Um, there's a lot of risk involved because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all we needed is one person to get sick, and we'd have to refund um, yeah. the, the the fees that we'd already spent. Yes, <laughs> the, yes. You know, the, ticket, the tickets prices that we'd already already spent. Uh, so it was scary and stressful and. Uh, frankly, it, it wasn't very profitable. So I would caution anyone yeah. who, who thinks that a sideline on their farming business might be a teaching uh, enterprise at the same time. Yeah. Um, it's, it can be very distracting and um, uh, it's, it can be quite risky. So we did that for a long time and we were, we were blessed by the fact that we um, never had a disaster. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in, yeah. In hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of courses, they all went very well, and um, uh, our students really enjoyed it, and we we got a reputation for bringing this kind of knowledge um, into the space. And then uh, we always knew that there was a better way of doing it, and because we had this technology background, uh, yeah. both Kirsten and I were video professionals for years before we did. Uh, we moved back to the family farm. We decided in 2018 to actually transition to online courses and uh, by sort of the end of 2019, we, we had our first online course ready to, uh, mm -hmm. ready to roll. Uh, and at that point, that's when we actually moved down here to Tasmania and launched that, that, that first course. So that was a good um, sort of six months before the pandemic hit. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it was a pretty good time to transition for our, for our organisation. Yeah. Um, so, and it means, you know, we, we, we have all those processes established now. So, you know, I'm talking to you from our, from our purpose-built studio um, yeah. and we've got a, a crew to, that supports all our students. That's awesome. Now, talk to me through a little bit about your permaculture living course. It's 12 weeks. So what kind of, what do you talk, what do you cover? Well, I think um, the, the focus is something which I think is dear to your heart. And that is that, you know, positive habits are a really powerful way to create the kind of life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. And um, a, lot of, a lot of permaculture courses are focused just on the techniques. And, yeah. and we do dive deep into a whole bunch of different um, techniques that you can use in your garden and in your home. But it's in a framework of, um, of creating permaculture habits you know, living a life which aligns with the ethics and principles of permaculture to create mm -hmm. a, 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 a strong and resilient, happy, healthy um, community, family, uh, mm -hmm. and self. Yeah. 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 Because again, we can, we can spend our entire life saving the planet, but if it, it, it pains us every day to wake up and do it, that's not a life. No, and and eventually people burn out. So yeah. um, you know the course is 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 sort of built framed around the twelve permaculture principles, and then for each week um, we dive deep into one of those principles, and we actually have people at the start of the course they develop a goal statement and they create mm -hmm. an action plan, and then each week as they go through the course they choose an action to add to their action plan, which reflects that that permaculture principle, um, and the kinds of action actions are really diverse. They might be from, you know, changing your energy sources. Uh, they might be about growing food, but they might also be about doing some estate planning or mm, yeah. um, some, some time budgeting or, uh, you know, being more active in your local community. All the things yeah. that we, we want to do, you know, all the things that we say, you know, we really should do that sometime. Yeah. Well, 
yeah. we get our students to commit to things and we hold them accountable so that yeah. they, over time, they, they, they tick off all these actions. And uh, we've had, I think I was looking at it the other day, and um, uh, I think we're up to nearly 20,000 actions that our students have taken. They've said they're going to do, and then later yeah. on they come back and they click off their, their action list and say, I've done oh, this thing. Oh, that's so cool. And what's, yeah. what software are you using to be able to track that kind of thing? Um, a lot of it's custom built. So okay, uh, things yeah. like that action plan we, we built from scratch. Um, okay. uh, it's handy having an IT background. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, other bits and pieces, uh, we use off-the-shelf online learning software um, and and then things like WordPress. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, just most of it's, most of it's yeah. fairly uh, stock. Uh, we try not to do too, too, too much custom stuff. Well, yeah, WordPress is an incredibly powerful platform if you know how to use it. Yeah. 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 yeah there's exactly. a lot you can do on it. Um, you know, that's really interesting what you said there because, you know, obviously you attack it at like a permaculture aspect. But what you're really people getting people to do is almost like do the hard stuff of life. Um, because I think, you know, the, the phrase Netflix and chill has destroyed us from doing a lot of that hard stuff. Yeah. I mean, we're all we all um, have times where we we want to mm -hmm. be passive. And Absolutely, we, yeah. You know, we need to take that that break. And um, the challenge is 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 that you, you've got to set up positive habits where you know you start the day by by doing something that fulfills you. And mm -hmm. and frankly, you know, if you wake up in the morning and um, you know you jump on your phone and you spend uh, an hour on YouTube or on Netflix or something, um, the the risk is is that you find yourself the days slip by and you find yourself um, not feeling very positive about yeah. about your life. And whereas if you get up in the morning and you know you 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 get under the chores and you uh, make yourself a healthy breakfast and you you get going and you you get your kid off with a smile to school and you know you you um, have some some so notches in your belt if you like each day yeah. of, of something that you feel feel positive about then um, by the end of the day you go to sleep with a smile on your face you know yeah well I, I like it too you know reactionary throughout the entire day instead of you know owning the day and putting the building blocks in place to get this big stuff done. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the hardest thing, the hardest thing in anybody's life. And, you know, there is, you, you can't um, minimize, you know, the challenges that people have with uh, mental health and mm -hmm. um, so much, so much, um, you know, addictive behavior that is crept into yeah. our lives. Th those things are huge challenges. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the vast majority of our, of our society um, in, in Western society is, is suffering from um, these kinds of things. Uh, so it's, it's not um, anything that should be trivialized and or taken for granted, you know, when yeah. you do have, you know, uh, um, that, that ability to um, get up and face the day with a positive positive attitude yeah. uh, that shouldn't be taken for granted you need to nurture that and you need we need to celebrate that in in people that uh can can do it well i think part of it too is that every single uh, there's the facebook's the youtube's their business model is your time and so they're yeah. desperately trying to get you on to stay on that app just a minute longer and when you really think about that what the, the big difference is and you know what your day can look like if you surrender to that that I, I think the big thing is, though, you know, we as humans are just fighting that aspect of these technologies which want to suck us in. And I think the whole permaculture thing is really taking, taking steps backwards and thinking about what does our life look like and then kind of defining, you know, what the different parts. And again, not that Facebook's all bad. I mean, we would not have the business we have without Facebook. I would not be able to communicate with farmers around the world and even you know, across the state without that. But there is some downsides that we need to, especially us who are trying to live a bigger life. And I feel those who are thinking about permaculture, it's you're thinking about that bigger life. How do you impact that around you? Yeah, that that's a huge challenge. Technology um, is the, the the thing which occupies people's mind and space so much now. Um, it's it's the the town hall. It's the mm -hmm. it's the public community space. Um, that we've lost in so many of our, our actual, uh, you know, bricks and mortar communities, um, that, that technology has, has stolen that or mm -hmm, captured mm -hmm. that. Um, and that means that, 
you know, you can't avoid participating it in it in some level, but it just comes down to how much you allow it to uh, dominate your life. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, I, I say to a lot of people is that if you can get up in the morning and you get yourself outside, you know, you just get yourself yeah. outside, you, you yeah. look at the, 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 the plants, the animals, you, you, you feed your chickens, you, you, um, you know, water, water the garden, um, get yourself started on, on a, on a, you know, reality footing rather than um, diving into, you know, the, the petty arguments and the um, you know, salacious uh, images yeah. that, 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 that social media sort of throws at us. Who's getting cancelled for what this weekend? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, always, there's always some sort of controversy that, um, that, that yeah. enrages us or angers mm -hmm. us or excites us. Or, yeah. And, you know, you're never going to be able to avoid it and you're probably going to end up participating in it, but try not yeah. to participate in it until, you know, after lunch or, or, you know, yeah. um, after you've, after you've done the things that will really fulfill you for the day. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go a little bit different here on your website. You talk about permaculture and the indigenous knowledges and, you know, kind of that, that history there and uh, the respect that we need to uh, pay to them. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, where, I mean, living right now um, on Malakadi country in mm -hmm. Lutruida, which is the, um, the traditional name for Tasmania. Um, mm -hmm. And the Malakadi people have been in this space for about 40,000 years, mm. um, which is, is, is just such a long, long time. It's, it's, it's impossible to comprehend. Um, Europeans, uh, landed and, and on this shore uh, about 200 years ago. So we're talking, um, you know, not, not 10 times as long, um, you know, not, uh, you know, 100 times as long, but 200 times as wow. long as what, as what yeah. um, Europeans have been here for. And in that time, the Malakadi uh, developed a relationship with this country that was completely intertwined with the ecosystem that is here. Mm -hmm. And they learnt how to manage it in ways that produced um, such incredible food and such um, amazingly healthy ecosystems that we have so much to learn from, from what they um, developed. Unfortunately, uh, similar to, I think, in, in North America, when white people came to um, Australia, the impact on Indigenous communities was was catastrophic. And um, horrific, yeah. And, and horrific. Um, there was, you know, genocide was committed, but also, you know, disease um, and, and completely new ways of thinking had um, such a... a um, horrible impact on on the way Indigenous uh, folks lived. Uh, and this is, you know, really well documented now. And I think anybody who can't, you know, accept the damage that was done um, and and recognise how um, how much of, an, of a, a travesty it was um, is, you know, in, in, in complete denial. Um, so it's, it's, I think, on on all of us to acknowledge that and then also um, start to under, try to understand and recognise the intricacies of um, in, Indigenous ways of, of living um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that can be um, valued now. Now, of course, context is everything and, and, and context has changed a lot and um, attempting to live in the same way now that context has changed is, is uh, probably um, not something that's, that's going to work out very well for, yeah. for most people. But um, that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't always approach our uh, land management with a respect for that Indigenous knowledge. Yeah, there's so many things that they did. And again, they perfected for thousands of years or even long, much longer than that, that we can take um, and, and acknowledge and just take, take, uh, take, just basically learn from, I think. I mean, like, look at the, in the US, the Western forest management. I mean, we, as, 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 as you know, as the whites in the last two, 300 years destroyed that. I mean, we have yeah. literally basically, you know, hurt ourselves so much from that. And if we just look back at how they manage that, 
then we would have been so much further ahead. Mm. I was uh, lucky enough last weekend to go um, snorkeling and mm. uh, harvesting um, these amazing uh, shellfish that we have down here called abalone. I'm not sure if you're mm -hmm. familiar with them, but yeah. they are one of the most um, you know prized shellfish on the planet. And um, you know there are still spots around here where you can in in 20 minutes you can bring up. Um, you know, me and a couple of friends, the bag limit down here is, is 10 of these abalone per person that you're allowed to, to harvest. And, you know, one abalone is enough to feed a person easily. You know, you, it's wow. hard to eat, yeah. eat a whole abalone. And, and we, we got into the water and we, we stuck our heads underwater and we immediately came up and said, okay, how many do we need? Because there's so yeah. many here that we don't, we don't want to harvest too many and uh, we, we just got five each for um, to be able to take home to our families and, and cook a few meals um, yeah. for everybody and while I was doing that I was uh, you know r reminiscing on the fact that there's not very many places left where you can you can do that and yeah this this country around where we are Malakati country was was um, that was one of the staple staple foods you know people people celebrated every year with with these feasts of of abalone and shellfish and um you know the local people here or at least on nearby uh people uh they 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 didn't even eat fin fish because um uh the the shellfish was so good that they wow. had uh, developed a cultural taboo for yeah. fin fin fish in, the, in these thriving waters yeah. um yeah. And, and to think that, that 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 was so bountiful, and now we have these gigantic salmon pens, um, you know, feedlots, you know, CAFO yeah. operations in the in the bays here that um, uh, you know trade upon Tasmania's clean green image uh, to sell a, a, a toxic product grown um, in an environment which is becoming more and more polluted with the feces of. Um, millions of, yeah. of introduced fish and um, the antibiotics that's pumped into the waterways to, to keep them healthy. And, and, yeah. and that's had a huge impact on not just the abalone, but, but all the other, um, you know, amazing uh, yeah. creatures that live in our, in our waterways. Well, just like the US, you know, back in colonial times, uh, lobsters were known as a food of the poor. And the rich yeah. people wouldn't eat them. And now it's completely switched because we've done such a poor job. Yeah. Well, abalone, abalone was known as mutton fish by the, by oh, the really? first whites who got here because they, they thought it was just, uh, you know, the, the lowest quality. <laughs> Even now the mutton is, is valued uh, yeah. highly or should be. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. We've got mutton fish and mutton birds. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 interesting and again you laugh about it a little bit but you know i think it's just sobering to think about on around the world just the changes that we have brought because we haven't stood back and think are we you know looking at this in a holistic way instead of just plowing through and you know taking everything yeah, and and this is a, a real difference. Um, I mean, indigenous folk um, around here and and in most places in the world got to a got to a stage once they'd lived in a place for long enough. Mm -hmm. I think, and uh, once you care for country for long enough, you get to a stage where um, you know country or um, you know the land is is what provides, and the ecosystem is what provides. And we've gotten to a state where you know w in most places in the world we we can't depend on on the natural environment to provide for us anymore so yeah. instead you know if a responsible person does have to start to take responsibility for their means of production and and their 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 way of providing their food for themselves and whether that be through supporting um, local regenerative farmers um, you know whether getting involved in your local food system by growing some stuff stuff for that for your community or, or whether it be you know just uh, growing some mushrooms for yourself or or, or putting a veggie garden in or, or, or growing herbs. Um, we can all do something, uh, but uh, it is our responsibility to start to take, um, take that responsibility back into our own homes, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk to us about your website, because you have a website with, I mean, a load of information, um, all yeah. sorts of articles. How did that come to be? So when we first moved um, to this remote farm, um, we uh, we wanted to stay in touch with people, and mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. we we wanted to um, uh, 
uh, learn and we documented that learning and uh, Kirsten my partner is a prolific writer and mm. uh, she um, right from the start she was like okay I'm going to put out a, a blog post um, at least once a week uh, to uh, to to document our journey and to to record what we were learning and, and as we started talking to more and more and more and more people and and uh, bringing these experts from all around the world um, we've built up a library now of, a, of about a thousand blog posts um, that dive into all kinds of different topics um, around living a, a more regenerative and holistic life um, wow. so there's there's it's a huge library of, of content there and um, we've I suppose from a business perspective, that's how that's how we made our reputation um, as being. I mean, nowadays people call it content-based marketing. Uh, from our perspective, yeah. we we were like produce good quality material, and then when we um, we say, okay, we've got something here that we've put a lot of extra work on into, and um, you know, to to recover that, we need to we need to charge for it. People will respect that, and they do choose to to um, purchase our courses uh, yeah. because uh, I mean if you like the stuff on the on the blog or you like the stuff on Instagram yeah. or you like the stuff um, uh, on our on our regular newsletter that we give for free then um, you wait till you see the stuff that we've we've spent uh, you know a year and a, yes. a team team working on to produce an online course um, you know each of each of our online courses are about a a, a one-year production cycle, um, mm -hmm. and and we have you know a team of five or six people working pretty much full time to produce um, each of those courses. Wow. Uh, so there's a, a huge investment um, that we put into those. So um, you know the price that we charge is is uh, a, a way of of paying those wages and and making sure that Milkwood as a as an organisation is sustainable. Yeah, and you can continue to do the deep work to keep learning that because again, we're always learning new things every single day and new techniques to move this whole movement forward. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, last year we did the uh, mushroom summit. We interviewed you know twenty seven different experts from all across, and just the the amount of information we were able to pack into that was just unbelievable. Um, and learning all these different species. Yeah, yeah. Mushroom cultivation is a is a fascinating um, fascinating world, and you know that that's where we found our um, niche is really mm -hmm. around the um, the the what do you need to know to mm -hmm. to grow um, at home, you know, and and that focusing on um, uh, you know narrowing it down and simplifying it, delivering it. We, we've both got backgrounds as educators and our team mm -hmm. are all professional educators and um, we really focus on on our students' learning outcomes. Um, what, 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 why is the student coming to this course? Um, yeah. and, and really narrow it down and focus on, on, on that uh, material which is, is most valuable to them. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Because you're right, there is so much extraneous and they don't need to know all of this, but it's kind of pulling this back given them the building blocks to move forward. But what I like to say too, because again, we work with farmers in all different niches with business training is giving them the principles and then how that principle can work into what they're trying to do. So not yeah, everyone's gonna do, yeah. Everyone's different. Every, everyone's context is going to be different. And um, you know, you need to you need to really start by building on those those first principles, I agree. 100%. It's it's amazing. Um, I mean, we've been teaching mushroom cultivation for a while now and and we 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 flat out everything that we teach and we, when we advertise yeah. and talk about our courses, we we talk about the fact that this is not a course for commercial mushroom growers. You know, our goal here isn't to do, go into the details of, yeah. of business, for example, yeah. how to yeah. how to yeah. make that profitable. Um, that said, we've now had I think we're up to about 30 um, 30 of our graduates who did our sort of introduction to mushroom yep, cultivation yep. course have started and, and continue to run um, successful mushroom cultivation businesses here in Australia. Um, That's awesome. Because yeah. they, they got the first principles down pat. You know, they, they, they really um, understand uh, the, the ecology of fungi and they understand the life cycle and they don't make, you know, beginner mistakes. Um, because we covered the beginner stuff really logically and smoothly and gave them a good foundation. And then they went off and they, they, they were mm -hmm. more empowered mm -hmm. to learn from experts. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Where are you on your thriving farmer journey? If you go to growingfarmers.com, you can click on our assessment, take our assessments, just a few questions, and what it will do is show you exactly where you are on the five stage thriving farmer journey. And what this will do then is give you some next steps, some resources to help you know what to focus on next in your business to move you to the next level with your farm. Now, one of the things you do is some waste mushroom cultivation. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, so, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the brilliant things about mushrooms, as you know, is that um, they, uh, they don't require, um, you know, they, 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 they grow on substrate, which is basically waste products from mm -hmm. uh, other, other agricultural systems. And um, we, we found that it's, it's very difficult for um, commercial growers to make a viable business with, with um, too high labour costs. I mean, labour costs, mushroom cultivation, it, it's a labour intensive uh, business model. And most um, commercial mushroom growers will reduce their labour costs by using disposable plastic. And yeah. it's, it's something which is um, ubiquitous throughout the mushroom cultivation uh, mm -hmm. industry. Uh, and what that means is that when most books that you pick up that are about mushroom cultivation are designed for the commercial grower. And they'll just assume that they, those growers are going to use disposable uh, plastic bags. Yeah. Um, so uh, what we've in, instead we've focused because our our, our mission is around uh, sustainability, both um, uh, from an environmental perspective and and from a from a home and community perspective. Uh, we've developed techniques which which basically eliminate disposable plastics in yeah. our mushroom cultivation. Um, so we use uh, a combination of different methods. Um, we use you know uh, reusable um, plastic buckets or pails. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. We use glass jars. Um, we use log cultivation and, and mushroom gardens so that we can produce a consistent high quality yield without having to sacrifice our environmental ideals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're doing that in those, uh, and what are those buckets? Cause they're like a, is that like a three gallon bucket? You're I'm showing, I'm just looking at your website right here. Um, so we've, we've actually used everything from, you know, I'm going to try to speak American here. <laughs> um, uh, everything from sort of uh, two quarts. Yep, yep, yep. A yep, half yep. gallon. Yep, that's right, it. That half yep. gallon. Uh, yep. Everything from half half gallon buckets um, right up to uh, four gallon. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, buckets and and they all work. Mm -hmm. I find a sweet spot is around about um, a one gallon bucket. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, I find that that for the home cultivator, uh, you can actually produce quite a lot of mushrooms um, yeah. on, in, in a one with a one gallon bucket um, and all your eggs aren't in one basket. If you go for the really big ones, then if you have make a mistake, um, yes. especially if you're, if you're purchasing grain spawn, if you're making yes. your own grain spawn, you can sort of take a few more risks, but grain spawn is expensive. And um, uh, by uh, dividing up um, that grain spawn into multiple uh, uh, buckets, you're more likely to, yeah. um, you know, spread your risk a little bit. Yeah. So I'm thinking like, cause we're doing like a, yeah, that's about right. Cause that's like about a 10 pound, right. Is a gallon. If you're, if you're doing <laughs> five kilo. Yeah. Yeah. Round about. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. If you're yep. doing like a, a sawdust and, and are you doing sawdust or typically straw? Again, don't want to give away um, all your secrets, but. No, 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 that's fine. Uh, we yeah. give away all our secrets all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, we usually use a mix of sawdust and straw. Um, oh. So um, I find that the, the straw is valuable because it gives you that, um, the, the, the ability for the mycelium to run along. Mm -hmm. They're like little mm -hmm. highways yeah. through the substrate. Yeah. Um, uh, but sawdust is, is, is a bit denser and there's a bit more nutrient to allow Absolutely. you to get mul multiple flushes. Um, yeah. so oyster mushrooms, we find growing on a mix of hardwood sawdust and, and, and straw do give this sort of longer yield, which is, is more useful for the home cultivator. Again, it's one of those things that commercial yeah. cultivators, often you want that first flush to be the big one and then yeah. get rid of them, um, yeah. for Found home cultivators. Half. Yeah. For, for home cultivators, it's, it's often nicer just to get. Uh, uh, enough for a meal mm -hmm. and then you know then a, a week later the bucket 
we'll flush again for another another meal and then it'll yeah. do it again. And if you've got three or four or five or ten buckets going, you've got all the food you, you need constantly, of different varieties even. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Get some of those uh, pinks in there and that gets real fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I, again, this is the kind of podcast I really, really enjoy because yes, we dive into some of the weeds, but we also hit some of the high level stuff, which again is, is so important for us to kind of reground ourselves. Cause obviously we can think about, okay, what's the best substrate. But when you think the big picture, I think that can be so important for us to really think that what would you say to someone who, you know, is looking at our kind of world from the outside, because I know there are those people. And again, I live in a town, very blue collar. Again, it's, they're very excited about the DQ on the corner. And when it shuts at five o'clock and in, in, for non-Americans, DQ is dairy queen. And, <laughs> and when it shuts at five o'clock, it's like their, their life is over. They're very upset. You know, what would you say to someone looking in kind of like the, we're, the lifestyle we're building? What would you say to them? There's nothing like a, a homegrown tomato. Um, there is, there is, is no experience like, uh, having, you know, eggs from your own chickens or, um, you know, uh, a home, uh, cured salami or a prosciutto mm. or, or people are drawn to, uh, the, the finest quality things in the, in life. Um, and the finest quality things that I experience are, you know, a homemade gin that my mm -hmm. friend has produced, you know, in, in their homemade still using the botanicals that they've grown in their garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't buy something like that. Um, we've had, you know, Michelin had chefs do our courses. We've had um, all kinds of uh, incredibly wealthy people um, come to do uh, things with us. And ev every time they uh, connect with this lifestyle, their their minds blown by the by the quality of um, the food that we eat and the quality of the experiences that we share. Yeah. So, Dairy Queen. Fair enough. Um, it might be, it's a bit like Facebook, you know, it's addictive and it might be something that uh, uh, is part of your life. Um, but don't kid yourself to think that you're getting the finest of life from that. Um, you know, when you, when you connect with the ground around you and you connect with people around you uh, and you share the produce that you produce, um, it's, it's beyond what you can experience on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. really appreciate your time, Nick, and uh, best of luck with uh, your upcoming courses and all of that. Thank you very much, Michael. It's been a, a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, if, if anybody wants to check us out more, um, come and take a look at our website. And uh, I, I would really encourage people to subscribe to our newsletter. It's, uh, it's packed full of goodness each, each fortnight or so. And um, we, we Australians don't sell very hard. Um, it's something that it's something that uh, Americans uh, I think um, uh, notice about us. We, we in Australia there's a we think what we call the tall poppy syndrome, okay. um, where where the tall poppy gets cut, cut down, uh, and um, so we're, we're we're pretty shy at sticking our heads up. Um, yeah. So I think Americans often appreciate that um, kind of uh, low sell approach that we yeah. have down here. So and I think you'll enjoy it. It's milkwood.net. That's correct. And then on Instagram, you guys are just, is it Milkwood Permaculture? Yeah, Milkwood underscore permaculture. Uh, pretty much if you punch Milkwood into a search engine, yeah. Uh, yeah. we'll be right at the top of everything. We've been around for a while. Yeah. And again, your Instagram's fabulous. Your website is, again, just full of information. So make sure you guys do go over there and get on that email list because it's well worth it. So again, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. Have a great day. Yeah. Hey, Thriving Farmers, have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. 
So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com. 